Greetings. The difficulty level of this video is easy. Today I'm going to introduce you to some of my research output as an expert in the fintech sector. Fintech stands for financial technology. It includes things like blockchain and cryptocurrency, but that is not the entirety of fintech by any stretch. There's many exciting areas of fintech that are outside of blockchain and certainly outside of cryptocurrency. So in January of 2018, I published this report about fintech, specifically the M&A and venture financing aspects of fintech, but also a directory of all the largest or otherwise most exciting fintech companies in the world. Now, since this was published in January 2018, some of the material is a little bit out of date, but not entirely so. There are aspects of fintech that are pretty mature and some of the fundamentals do not change that much. I wrote this report when I was with a firm called Woodside Capital. I've since moved on from there to Greener Pastures, and they have never had a fintech expert either before my time there or after my time there, as you can see from their website. There are very few fintech experts in the world, especially ones who have been in it for many years. Therefore, do not contact me at this email address. You should contact me either through this channel or through LinkedIn. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people, including on YouTube, have become Bitcoin experts or cryptocurrency experts in the last six months. You may have been following a number of YouTube channels and suddenly the host of that channel is talking about Bitcoin and how they're a Bitcoin expert and things like that. Instead, you have to see who has been in it for a long time. Now, am I a luminary in the subject of fintech or not? Well, considering the fact that I have spoken at conferences with audiences of up to 3,000 people, including the premier fintech conference in the world, Money 2020 in Las Vegas, where I was the keynote speaker, the fact that I have been on a number of TV shows to discuss the subject of fintech as well as blockchain, and the fact that I teach this subject at Stanford University and have done so for some time in two different departments of Stanford University, you should take that into account. Does that make me a luminary or not? That is for you to decide. But you can research that I have been in this particular subject for many, many years, as opposed to those who have become experts in just the last six months. And those who are familiar with this channel are aware that I don't recommend that average people get involved in things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. People are making money in that, but I don't think it's suitable for average people. What is going on right now is a classic pump and dump scheme where knowledgeable insiders are bidding up the price and the hype machine is helping them propel the price upwards so that less sophisticated average people buy at the top and bear all the losses as the insiders cash out. I believe that is what is going on right now. I could be wrong, but I just don't recommend that average people get caught up in things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Now onto the report itself, you can see the table of contents over here, and there'll be a link to this report in the description box below. It is downloadable as a free PDF. Section number one is an overview of the various subsections within FinTech, of which there are many. Section two is M&A transactions up to that point in time, January 2018. Section three, private placements up to that point of time as well, of course. Then public company profiles, private company profiles, and coin offerings that were current at the time. So some aspects of this report are relatively outdated given the time of publication, but there are many aspects that are not. In particular, this report is very useful for someone seeking a job in a fintech company because the directory of companies has information about the executives of each major fintech company, their names, their titles, the mailing address of the company, and what vertical that particular company is in. So it's very useful for a job seeker who's trying to get a job within a fintech company, but it's also useful for someone in M&A for fintech, as well as someone in a big company that is looking to do acquisitions of smaller companies in the fintech sector. So as we scroll down this report, a basic overview of fintech, financial services are the largest sector in the economy, and therefore the conversion of financial services from low-tech to high-tech is in fact one of the largest technological disruptions in the world. If you're familiar with other videos on this channel, as well as my Atom thesis, you're aware that the entire economy is characterized by the conversion of low-tech to high-tech, and therefore the rate of change of all products and services in what has now become high-tech is growing much more quickly and at an exponential trend. And fintech is just when that process reaches the financial services sector. As we scroll down, you see projections of fintech revenue worldwide. And over here, you see the disruption sequence of fintech. These are the 10 major sectors of fintech, and some of them have seen disruption happen over a decade ago, and some of them are just in the midst of disruption right now. But these 10 are lending, payments, remittances, 
which means sending of money from one country to another country, financial research, research reports around stocks, bonds, real estate, things like that, wealth management, crowdfunding, blockchain for fintech. And this is not just blockchain in a cryptocurrency sense, but blockchain within these other subsectors of fintech. Institutional capital raising, regulatory compliance, a very boring area, but very costly and therefore a huge opportunity for disruption. And insurance, same here. Insurance is a very big business and pretty low tech and a technological disruption can make not only insurance cheaper, but increase consumption of insurance as we'll talk about. Now this chart from Spark Labs is very, very important because it helps you visualize why the wave of conversion of low tech to high tech is rippling through financial services in a certain sequence. The outer shell of the sphere is what was disrupted first, banking tech and payments. Then you get to cyber currency, then business finance and consumer finance. And as it goes deeper and deeper through the sphere, it gets to the ultimate core, which is a dramatic modernization and optimization of all consumer finance, because that is when there is a tremendous increase in the prosperity of average consumers, because all the friction and fees associated with all the financial transactions that they do and the cost of fraud, cost of compliance, insurance, and other aspects of just protecting the consumer, which are very expensive right now, get cheaper, thereby creating more money that goes into the consumer's pocket. Now, as we scroll down more, this is a chart of revenue versus disruption, the amount of revenue and the level of disruption, but this is back in 2015, so somewhat long ago. As we scroll down further, you see a lot of the venture financing and M&A data. Now, this was current through 2017, so a little bit out of date. And also the most active VCs in fintech. This list doesn't fluctuate around that much, but these are the biggest VCs in fintech. If you want to be in a fintech company, look at what portfolio companies these venture capital firms are investing in. It's a good way to sort through opportunities and perhaps see which opportunities are more compelling than others. Scrolling further down, we talk about fintech subsectors and M&A potential therein. Now, lending, as we talked about, was one of the first areas of fintech disruption. There is micro lending, there is reduction of fees associated with lending, everything from mortgages to micro loans between individuals and a list of companies to watch and likely acquirers in this space. So the description describes exactly where the disruption is occurring. The same in payments and billing, it's one of the first. You know, PayPal was around as far back as 2001, 2002, and the same story over here. Payments is, in fact, an ever-evolving aspect of fintech. It's not even mature yet. I did a video about a payments company called Stripe, which is relatively new, but at this time, May 2021, it is priced at $95 billion, and it got from zero to $95 billion in a relatively short time. So it's almost one of those gigantic tech successes. Remittances. Now, if you live in America, you may not realize how big of a business this is, but there are over $500 billion of remittances worldwide, usually from someone in a rich country sending money to a family member in a poorer country. And because of the degree of international fraud, the fee on most remittances is about 7%. And since there's $500 billion of remittances done every year, a 7% fee on $500 billion is $35 billion worth of fees. That is how much the middlemen are taking just for compliance, security, and anti-fraud measures. This is $35 billion that is not going to relatively poor recipients. And a tremendous modernization of this mechanism is very, very long overdue. And just like all the other subsectors, I describe companies to watch and likely acquirers in this space. Financial research and reporting, modernization of that type of report production and other research report generation. Wealth management, there are automated wealth managers. You're familiar with companies like Wealthfront, Motif Investing, and others. Crowdfunding, I think all of you are familiar with things like Kickstarter. And the Jobs Act that was recently passed did a lot for increasing fundraising capabilities through crowdfunding. Distributed ledgers, which is unofficially known as blockchain, even though that's incorrect terminology, as I will explain. Distributed ledgers have a big section about them, which I was describing as far back as January 2018, the publication date of this report. Now, remember, cryptocurrency is not the only use of distributed ledgers. In fact, I think that cryptocurrencies are a distraction from the real human betterment potential of distributed ledgers. And cryptocurrency is just a sideshow that is easy for the media to fill headlines with. 
and easy for sophisticated insiders to extract money from unsophisticated average people that they can sucker into cryptocurrency. But aside from the layer of cryptocurrency, distributed ledger does have a lot of uses in reducing transaction costs and contract enforcement costs. And I'm going to have a bunch of videos about this over the course of this channel. In fact, I have a blockchain market map, which was current at the time, but there are all these companies in all these subsectors of blockchain, exchanges, mining, wallets, financial services, payments, infrastructure, and more. Mining is just when you use a specialized computer to do more and more complicated math problems to unlock a particular cryptocurrency. It is not necessarily a very useful activity and it draws resources away from where those resources could be put to better use for human betterment. But mining does have a lot of companies behind it to produce these specialized machines to mine various cryptocurrencies. And then I also describe institutional capital fintech and regulatory capital fintech. There are a lot of companies trying to automate the regulatory compliance process, which can save corporations a lot of money. And most of all, insurance as well. Insurance has a lot of opportunity for modernization, which lowers insurance premiums, which means more people get insurance. And therefore, a number of financial ecosystems and broader society as a whole enjoys greater robustification because things are more heavily insured and in a greater variety of ways because it was more affordable to get more types of insurance up to greater degrees of coverage. It sounds very boring, but it's not because it makes the entire system much more resilient when you can lower the cost of insurance. Scrolling down further, there's a comprehensive fintech market map by Venture Scanner. And this is a superset of the blockchain market map that we saw earlier. Lending a huge sector, as we described, 450 plus companies, personal finance, 250 companies, payments, almost 500 companies, equity financing, 147 companies, and so forth. So these are a huge universe of companies that even at the time of this report, we're disrupting many aspects of fintech. This is really a very diverse sector with a lot of companies trying to fix one particular problem each. Scrolling down further, you have my specialty within a specialty, which is artificial intelligence in fintech. AI obviously feeds off a lot of data and there's a lot of data in financial services. So there are many companies that are trying to automate some particular aspect of financial services entirely through artificial intelligence. In fact, this was the subject of when I was a keynote speaker at Money 2020 in Las Vegas in 2018. As you can see here from this market map, regulatory compliance and fraud detection is the biggest sector within the AI and fintech market map. And this is for the reasons I mentioned before. It's very boring yet expensive for companies to comply with this and automating parts of that can be lucrative because you're saving tons of money for the biggest corporations in the world, particularly those with international transactions or very complex tax situations. Scrolling down further, I have a section about initial coin offerings as they were called at the time in early 2018. And that was the previous crypto boom, but just a simple section about that because I don't endorse that as the most important aspect of FinTech and I include market maps over here. Now, m and transacts. I did m and investment banking for quite a long time, and there is a lot of potential in fintech even today. And I just list out a lot of recent transactions, which you can go through. Of course, this report is a little outdated on this front, but you may find this interesting just to look at all this line by line and see whatever patterns you can find out for yourself from this. The same goes for the private placement financing. Many fintech companies have gotten very big venture rounds. 400, 500 million dollar rounds or more. And you can scroll through this and look at all the details if you want, if you're interested in a particular subsector of FinTech. Public company acquirer profiles. These are the companies doing the acquiring. And there's just a couple dozen of these, but I do give a detailed profile of each and their recent acquisitions and who their executives are. So this is more of a directory of all these big companies that may acquire smaller fintech companies. So if you're interested in that, you can look through this. And then scrolling down to the final section, select private fintech companies. And I feature the biggest ones and most medium sized ones in this report. Some have grown a lot larger since the time of this report. Some have gotten acquired, but for the most part, this directory is still very useful for anyone interested in looking at private venture funded fintech companies. And I profile more than 100 of them. If you're a job seeker, this is extremely valuable to you because it will show you which companies exist in which verticals, what the name of their top executives are, their mailing address, their website, and what you want to do to get a job in these companies is to see when they got their most recent financing and what job openings they might have on their website 
and infer from those where to focus your effort. Remember, hiring happens as soon as a company gets venture financing. That's when they hire a lot of people that they've wanted to hire for a while but could not because they did not have funding. So more than 100 fintech companies profiled. And the profiles are as I described with address, country, main investors, and names of the executives. The main investors are also important because you can contact them to see what their investment thesis is and send them your resume if you're a job seeker. They might decide that you fit into some of the other companies that they're financing rather than the one that you found them through. So this directory goes on for quite a while. Again, this is a 182-page report. But if you're interested in the fintech sector for whatever purpose that I described above, then I hope this report was useful for you and it is linked in the description box below. Remember that I wrote a very similar report about artificial intelligence, which I am linking to in the tile right above here, and it is structured in very much the same format. So if you're also interested in that sector, you may wish to check out that report as well. If you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.